Um, today, I'd like to talk about the current situation of women in politics, and especially women's underrepresentation in Japanese politics. But I also like to highlight um, the cultural shift uh, has been going on, and that we need to seek generational equality in Japan. And let me briefly give you the overview of the, uh, the women's representation in Japanese politics. Uh, women make up 9.9% uh, .9 in the lower house and 22.9% in the upper house. The world average of women's representation is now around 25%. So you can see that Japan lags far behind from the world average. And if you compare the situation of the lower houses around the world, Japan ranks at around 160, 165th among 194 countries. And if you look at governors and mayors, the situation is probably even worse. Uh, we have only two governors uh, among 47 prefectures, and we have only two mayors among mega cities. And if you look at mayors of municipalities, a women's ratio is less than 2%. So, um, uh, so Japanese politics is really a male dominated, as you can see. And I'd like to give you some uh, historical trend. Um, the Japan is uh, this uh, green line, and you can see that in the last 10 to 50, 15 years, the Japanese situation has been stagnated. There are not much change. And UK, I, I put a red line for UK. And if you look at the 1980s, maybe I can show that yeah, around here, 1980s, uh, the situation is pretty much the similar uh, between UK and Japan, women's make up less than 5% in both countries. But uh, by 2020, uh, the, it's so contrasting that UK succeeded in increasing women where Japan has been stagnated. Uh, in order to change the situation, uh, le uh, three years ago in, uh, in 2018, Japanese diet uh, passed a gender parity law. Uh, that was a private member's meal. That means that that was drafted by a parliamentarian group. Uh, that was an all-partisan all parliamentary group, which was set up in 2015. And I served as academic advisor to this uh, parliamentary group. And uh, the, the, the group was created due to the pressure coming from the civil society organization, especially women's movement, which uh, demanded uh, quotas, uh, the legal quota in Japanese politics. And the key organizer was a uh, women's organization, uh, which is called Association Q. That means association uh, to promote a quota in Japanese politics. And the gender parity law's basic principle is that it requires all political parties to aim at uh, fielding an equal number of male and female candidates in all elections. Uh, you might notice that it is only aiming at. So parties are uh, encouraged to aim at uh, fielding an equal number. So there is no uh, tease in it. It's, it's not compulsory, but this is just a principle. But um, all the parties nonetheless agreed on the passage of this law. And also parties are encouraged to take some special measures, especially setting a numerical target of female and a male candidate. Uh, we didn't use the term quota because there's so much resistance against a quota. Uh, quota are not, not so known in Japan. So uh, we, uh, the law actually used the term numerical target. Um, but uh, yeah, so after the law, uh, we, we're gonna have the first, uh, the law has election uh, sometimes uh, soon, uh, between now until uh, uh, October. So we will see how this law will be effective. Uh, but we had a law upper house election after the passage of the law, and which actually contribute, contributed to the increasing number of uh, women candidates. So we can say that there is a little bit of a contribution, but it doesn't have much a great impact yet. So we, we will see. Uh, but at the same time, in the last 
last one to two years, but at least since 2017, um, there's a, a big change uh, in the atmosphere of the Japanese society. Uh, the, the public uh, getting more aware of the sexism, which is root, uh, which is deeply rooted in Japanese culture and especially in Japanese political culture. So it started from Me Too movement as well as uh, uh, everywhere in the world. And then in 2018, there was a really watershed that the number of incidents happened in this year, which uh, started from the sexual harassment by, by Vice Minister of Finance. And also there's a scandal of the entrance exam or medical school because it turned out that it discriminated against women. And also students on campuses, various, various campuses started to activate their actions to demand uh, the education of sexual consent. So around this time, uh, the media started to, uh, to, to report lots of uh, cases of sexism in the Japanese society. And then 2019, we had a flower demo, which is a grassroots movement or rallies, uh, which took place every month and in all 47 prefectures, uh, which demand for uh, the changes, amendment of the penal code uh, to have a more like a Swedish style of yes means yes uh, uh, regulation. And also we had a kutu movement. It's a play of word, uh, which means that a kutu of a shoes and a kutu of pain. So it's, uh, uh, and, uh, thanks to this kutu movement, the government finally admitted that uh, women should not be forced to wear high heels on workplaces. Uh, and also the students also uh, activated a, a campaign against sexual harassment during job hunting. And then 2020, uh, the gender gap index uh, from the, the Davos uh, Congress uh, published and Japan's ranking was 121st. Uh, that gave a wave shock in the Japanese elite and also Japanese uh, society. Uh, that was really a shocking number because as at the time, Prime Minister Abe was advocating for women's empowerment. So people thought that uh, even though Japan lags behind, still there must be some kind of progress but actually the ranking dropped by 10 uh 10th place so people are so shocked and ever since um that year that that, that was you know we cannot hide the fact anymore the people started to really face the reality and uh, we see lots and lots of journals uh, and articles which talk about uh, discrimination against women and then the final blow uh, came this year. Uh, Mr. Mori, uh, he was former Tokyo Olympics chief, uh, made a sexist remarks, and he was forced to resign, uh, step down from the position. So that that if that happened uh, uh, one or two years ago, maybe he he didn't need to step down. So I think that society completely changed in the last three, four, five years. The accumulation of the many layers of these incidents and the people started to aware that uh, this kind of sexist remarks and sex, uh, discrimination against women cannot be permitted and it should not be permitted in Japan. And then we got a new uh, gender gap index, uh, which indicated that Japan ranked at 20, 120th. So uh, that's uh, the signal that the, the more, uh, you know, the, the more uh, fundamental changes need to be done. And I give you uh, some uh, the data to tell you the cultural shift of Japanese society. So this is based on the World Value Survey. The question is, uh, the, the respondents were asked to agree or disagree with the statement that men make better political leaders than women do. And 25 years ago, in Japan, 43% of respondents agreed with this statement. But now, according to the latest uh, data, only 22% of respondents agree with the statement. So you can see that there is a, a drop of this statement. So the, 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 the gender bias or gender stereotypes has been reduced to some extent. And if you look at the number in, in UK, uh, there's only two points to compare. But uh, around uh, mid 
2000s, uh, the, the people who agree with the statement was 18%. So it's probably similar to the current situation of Japan. But what I, what I like to emphasize is that this number, if you look at the young generations under 29, and especially women, only 6% of them agree with the statement. So yes, there is a, you know, the, the cultural shift that overall, um, people have less and less view of this stereotypical perception of a man's leader, but there's a huge generational gap. And also there is a gender gap as well. So we really need to encourage young women to engage with politics to accelerate the speed of change in Japan to achieve gender equality in politics. And then I also, uh, beside the academic work, I'm running an academy for gender parity. It's an NGO uh, which provides the training to young women to, to be ready to run for office. And we started uh, this academy uh, since uh, 2018. And I founded uh, this Academy for Gender Parity uh, with my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Kion Shin. And we visited uh, many uh, organizations uh, in the United States, uh, which provide the training uh, programs. And then uh, we decided that we need such programs in Japan as well. And uh, we clearly set the vision for this uh, endeavor. So our vision is uh, inclusion and respect and justice. So we recruit uh, women who share the vision with us. So we train uh, young uh, women who want to create a society in which inclusion and respect and justice are fulfilled. And, and we, especially uh, what we do is that we try to uh, build uh, three C's. One is a confidence and two is capacity and three is community. So we try to uh, build up uh, the confidence of young women. Uh, women tend to lack confidence uh, because uh, they think that the politics is male world. So they clearly lack confidence. So we, we talk about uh, the motivations and we talk about what politics means to them. So in order to really build up confidence. And also we emphasize the capacity building and, and especially like uh, public speaking because it's so scary to give a speech. Everyone hates that. But what, what we do, the training, it's so amazing that the people have, a, you know, people increase the capacity. And at the end of the camps and at the end of the programs, uh, people have a great at touching uh, the speeches, which also build their confidence as well. And also we, we think that community building is another key uh, component of our program because politics cannot be done by oneself. Uh, politics is always uh, doing with colleagues. So, and also women like to have community. So we emphasize that uh, the participants gonna need to be connect with each other and also create their own community to support each other. And we have we provide uh, lots of programs and three day camp and also a one day uh, workshop, etc. Uh, but in the last year, we are forced to do only online uh, workshops, and which is kind of difficult to create community because uh, you know we cannot have any small talks. So. Um, so we, with this year, we have to continue to provide only online workshops. So we're gonna, we decided to have more like open to the public kind of workshop. And the results, we've been operating this for the last three years. And we had uh, one big uh, local election and also upper house elections. And five candidates ran for local elections and four were erected. And, and two candidates also ran for uh, by elections and also they won. And for the upper house election, three candidates ran, uh, but they were narrowly defeated. And now two candidates are preparing for the lower house election. So as a, such a short term uh, result, I think uh, we are quite proud that uh, we've been doing quite well. And also we are training train, trainers too, because we're gonna spread this kind of activities all over in Japan. So, so Kyo and I are only two college professors who are extremely busy. So we cannot have, you know, 
you know, uh, some, only a, a small number of, of workshops. So we are training actually trainers so that we can expand our programs. So next steps. Um, so uh, the the young generation is really hope. They are more leaning and they they are more active and they they very much engaged with politics and they are very vocal. So now we need to change uh, political parties and also we have to change uh, legal foundation. So gender parity law is fine, it's great, but it need to be amended. It need to be strengthened. And actually, all the parliamentary group has been discussed uh, how to amend this gender parity law. So the one of the target is to make the numerical target mandatory. Uh, so far, four parties set the numerical target. Uh, some two parties set at three, 30 percent and one party set at 50 percent. So that's good, but the largest party, LDP, the conservative party, uh, is very much struggling. Uh, uh, some of the women members of ADP uh, demand the party to set up the 30% target, but there are lots of resistance within the party. So hopefully uh, the gender party law is amended and make it mandatory so that all the parties have to set a numerical target but the, the percentage can be decided by themselves. It can be 30%, it could be 50%, depending on the party's willingness and also the situation. So that's a small step, but that's a very important step. And also uh, the parliamentary group uh, uh, try to, uh, to change, uh, amend public subsidy law to political parties to, to give incentives so that uh, parties might be able to get more subsidies if they feel more women. Uh, so that's another idea. And also uh, the gender parity law should be amended to include a clause uh, which, uh, uh, which include uh, prevention of violence against women in politics. And the situation is bad as, uh, as anywhere in, in other world. And also in the Japanese, uh, the feature is that many women candidates and the politicians receive uh, violence and harassment from the voters as well, not just from the male, uh, the powerful politicians, but the harassment from voters uh, is reported and uh, the situation is quite serious. So we need to have some sort of legal foundation to prevent such harassment and also violence. But another thing that can be done is um, the IP, uh, to have an IPU gender sensitive parliament audit. The Sarah, Professor Sarah Chai told me that a UK uh, parliament received uh, this audit two years ago. And at the timing of the celebrating the 100th anniversary of the, the first suffrage. Actually, tomorrow is April 10th. That's the day of suffrage in Japan. It's, it's going to be a 75th anniversary of the first day that Japanese women cast vote. That was in uh, 1946. And we're going to have a big, big event tomorrow. I've been organizing even every uh, year since uh, 2016 on that day, but tomorrow is the 75th anniversary, but we're going to have a four hour online webinar to celebrate it. Uh, and I like to really invite uh, IPU audit uh, based on IPU, IPU is an inter-parliamentary union, which has a gender sensitive toolkit. And, and if you, you invite audit, just like you would uh, UK parliament, uh, Japanese parliament have to uh, the check all the procedures to make their uh, the co make their regulations more gender sensitive. So I think this is the another way that we can improve the situation so that uh, women's representation representation can be improved. Okay, well thank you. Thank you very much for attending this seminar and thank you to the Daiwa Foundation for inviting me. It's always lovely as well to be on a panel with Mari. We've um, mm. met over the years and it's always fantastic to hear mm. about other people's research. And I think at the end of our, both of our presentations, we're going to say something about what we can lesson learn from each other. But I, I would just stress how fascinating it, it is to see how feminist professors of political science have to mm. also uh, be active on the ground trying mm -hmm. to change our politics. So we study it, but we're also very much involved in trying to transform 
politics. And I think that's something that is true of um, many of our colleagues around the world. I, in fact, overnight, I had an email from some colleagues in Canada who themselves are interested in doing audits uh, and working with um, subnational parliaments to see how gender sensitive they are. So what I'm going to do today is to give some context to uh, understanding the representation of women in British politics, particularly in the House of Commons, and to consider it as gender insensitive, but I would add not uh, unchanging. I think that's the other thing. We sometimes think of politics um, as terribly resistant, and of course it can be, but I think there are quite clearly um, ways in which we can reform our political parties, reform our parliaments. And I thought um, Mari's point about the uh, about timing and younger women's desire to see change is really important when we think about how we build extra parliamentary pressure to transform our politics. So I do want to start by telling you a little bit about um, how back in 2015, I invited myself into the UK House of Commons um, rather presumptuously, but I decided that if they let me in, I could change it. So that tells you something about um, some academic arrogance. But I think it's also a bigger point, which is actually we do know some of the, you know, we know lots about the barriers. We know lots about what needs to happen. What's difficult when we think about change in politics and political parties and parliaments is actually the political will. So it's not that we don't know what causes the underrepresentation of women in politics or what needs to be done to uh, rectify it, but it's actually ensuring others take up that challenge. So I invited myself in, luckily they let me in, and, and that's another story, but happy to answer some questions about that in the Q&A. But I drew on the Interparliamentary Union's um, gender sensitive parliaments framework. They have more dimensions, but I worked with three. I was advised um, that when you're dealing with parliaments and parliamentarians, sometimes having fewer uh, focus foci is important, they can keep three in their head, but maybe seven is a little bit too much. So what I wanted to try to do was to capture this red, amber, green analysis to, to show where the House of Commons was insensitive. And of course, I looked at the data that was readily available, and some of these are arguably subjective considerations, but nonetheless, it was to try to give parliamentarians a very quick picture of what was wrong with their parliament and just how much needs to be done because I think that's sometimes another problem with trying to make politics more gender inclusive is that we blame women they don't have the right resources the right experiences they might not be um, speaking in the right kind of confident uh, rhetorical flourishes that are expected um, and actually we have to do more than that we have to fix the institutions to accommodate women not try to make women fit into the, the uh, institutions that already exist. So this chart documents in terms of how many women participate in parliament and where do they participate. It looks at the kind of infrastructure, the extent to which the actual way that politics is organized and undertaken at Westminster may cause difficulties for women and other underrepresented groups. And I'll say that in a moment. And also the culture because we have to think about how we might need to change formal rules, but also informal ways of doing politics so that they are more inclusive. And I did, um, when I was doing my work in the House of Commons, shift from a gender sensitive parliaments approach to a diversity sensitive parliaments approach, recognizing that other groups are also underrepresented. Um, and, to, and to, to also recognize, of course, that women are also um, different in themselves. So we have multiple identities. So we need to be, be careful that we don't um, just think about discrete categories of people. But let me say something to begin with about numbers. So I'm going to show you a few charts. I'm going to go through them quite quickly because I think they tell different stories. And this, this for me, is, is worth stressing. We can get... Um, carried away by headlines after general elections saying that we have an unprecedented number of women when only a few more have been elected because it's unprecedented because a couple more you know the actual number has gone up we need to think about numbers we need to think about percentages so this chart these charts show change over time and seeing how particularly from 1997 we have seen quite significant improvements in the the Westminster Parliament the lower house uh, in the UK, the House of Commons, and now that we are up to one third following the 2019 general election. So we have a nice positive story, but it's not quite as certain or as confirmed perhaps as these figures suggest. Because we often, and 
frequently rely upon a, a rhetoric which is about the underrepresentation of women. And actually, colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues, Rainbow Murray, says we should start talking about the overrepresentation of men. And so when we just see figures with nice upward trajectories of the numbers of women increasing, we forget, because we've taken men out of the picture, just how uh, male dominated, even a parliament that's done relatively well over the last sort of generation, still is. So it's important to play with the uh, sort of the um, visual representations to see a little bit more of the nuance that's underpinning outcomes. And we need to therefore think about how we frame arguments for change, but also the kind of interventions. So perhaps in a sense, the previous figures looked much more optimistic, whereas this I think reinforces the imbalance between men and women. There is no room for complacency in the UK. It's also important to look at the party distribution of women. Mari mentioned this uh, in the Japanese context. Again, when we look at the national percentage, we can sometimes misrepresent the distribution of um, women's political presence across political parties. So this slide looks at the presence of women uh, MPs from the major parties at Westminster. And we have to stress the ongoing party asymmetry. So we might want to be thinking about to what extent are higher numbers of women and higher percentages of women a reflection of the electoral success of one or one or two political parties rather than the system overall. Of course, the risk if um, the, the, the composition of your house is reliant on the success of one or two political parties is if they then suffer an electoral swing against them, then the numbers will decline. So of course we have seen rebalancing here in the percentage uh, of women uh, across the parties. In 1997, in 1997, Labour women were 101 of all 120, so really asymmetrical. And we have seen some rebalancing. And you can see that also with the rise of the Scottish national parties. But I also want to move to the next slide, which shows the percentage of women relative to the sex breakdown of the two main parties here. So on the previous slide, you saw a rebalancing between Labour and the Conservative Party in terms of women. But actually here we're reminded that as a percentage of their own party, we see big differences. So the Labour Party currently is over 50 percent female, whereas the Conservative Party, our party of government, is much lower, just over a quarter. So that difference gets hidden when we only look at the national percentage. And I think that I always work with the basis, although this isn't uncontested, but I always work with the basis that if you are a supporter of women in politics, you should want to see parity of women across all political parties, even those ones that you don't particularly like. If you really believe in, in equal representation, it cannot just be in some parties and not others, but feel free, of course, to disagree. I think we also need to ask about which women participate in our politics. And there are big debates about um, the difficulties of identifying diversity amongst women. But if we just here look at two dimensions, uh, sex, gender, and um, black and minority ethnic women MPs, again, we see differences between the parties. So there's party asymmetry again, but we also can look at how women relative to men from black and minority ethnic communities are represented. So I think it is important to, to uh, really explore which women are able to access our politics. Again, if, if we believe in equality of participation between men and women, we would also, and should be, in my view at least, be, be concerned if the presence of those women are skewed to particular kinds of women. And that, for me, is also something that campaigns and training, as Mari was talking about, need to recognise. We should not be reproducing very elite um, men's presence with elite women's presence, we should be looking for diversity. I wanted to just briefly draw on the words of a former Labour woman MP and a disabled Labour woman MP. Uh, and this speaks to, again, Mari's point about quotas. And of course, she stressed that the quota, the parity law uh, was very uh, cautious. It, well, it's about aims and it's about uh, targets I mean, being encouraged as opposed to being very prescriptive. But we need to think about both the supply pool, to what extent are women aiming to 
put themselves forward for selection and election, but also the demand side. To what extent are our political parties open to the recruitment of women? And sometimes this account gets rather crudely represented as if the supply pool is fixed. And actually, I want to suggest that what parties do, and I'll go on to say what parliaments do, can actually encourage an increase in the size of those women who want to put themselves forward. Where you make demands of political parties to select and elect more women, then parties will go and find them. And I just think this is a rather wonderful quote. De Dame Anne Begg uh, first got elected in 1997, making clear that had her party not signaled, had they not gone looking for her, she probably would not have found herself in that supply pool. So political recruitment, I think the point I'm really trying to make here is that we should think of that as an active verb. It's not something that just happens, but actually is something that is active and needs to be undertaken in order to bring about diversity in representation. So the Good Parliament report that I wrote in 2016, informed by the IPU, I've also subsequently worked with um, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and UN Women to take forward these ideas of gender sensitizing parliaments, particularly in the post-COVID period. And what I think is so important, I think would be so valuable for the Japanese parliament is to undertake that audit, whether it's uh, with, with an organization or whether it's done internally. I always, always think you need to have a gender expert there as I know the IPU do, but it enables you to sort of create that snapshot of the insensitivities and then to really draft up bespoke reforms. Reforms that actually address and target the particular manifestations of those participatory infrastructure and cultural dimensions of what makes for an institutionally uh, gender sensitive parliament. So I produced a report with 43 recommendations, not a terribly helpful number. There's, that's because in, there's one that's hidden because it was too toxic. That was about breastfeeding. And there was a second that was about uh, creating job share for MPs, which was so even more toxic. And therefore that gets I, I can't decide whether it was elegantly or inelegantly dealt with in a footnote and another pamphlet, another, another piece of work was done on that. And I remember being told at the time, could you just have a few recommendations? And it was really important for me, and I think this is often the case, is that people like the idea of having three or so reforms as if that will solve the problem. And I think what's really important that an audit does is that it reveals just how saturated with masculinized practices and norms our parliaments are. And so actually you can't just address three things because just getting more women in won't change everything. We mustn't think in those kind of terms. So I, I went for an approach where I really tried to create a shopping bag of reforms that I wanted to hand over to the parliament. It's very important that the parliament takes ownership of its responsibility as an institution to make itself better in terms of being inclusive and representative and diverse. So I was able to work with the then speaker, John Burko, and in fact, he uh, created a particular group, the Commons Reference Group for Representation and Inclusion, that then between 2016 and 2018, took this uh, set of reforms, took the agenda forward. So actually, the other point I would want to stress is that an audit helps you identify the insensitivities from which you can then draw up a set, a set of reforms to redress those, but you also need to think about institutional capacity. Who will take the leadership on this? To what extent does the parliament have sufficient data, people in place, processes to bring about this change? And there have been many, many more um, successes than I had thought at the time possible, but also some, some failures, particularly around what I think is necessary, which would be legislative quotas. And in fact, in the UK, we don't even have um, if anybody's really interested, we have uh, Section 106 of the Equality Act 2010, uh, which would have um, ensured that political parties kept candidate diversity data. We haven't even managed to get that introduced, even though there was a campaign in that centenary year of 2018 to try to bring about that. There's been government resistance on that. So I do not want to stand here and suggest that the British Parliament has made itself uh, a perfect parliament or even a good parliament. There has been some quite considerable progress, but on some of those core interventions, I point to work around quotas, but I would also talk about um, the restoration and renewal of the parliament. We've recently had 
some hybrid working, of course, in the COVID period that I think is huge potential for diversity and inclusion that is not being continued. Um, but I do want to, to, to close my conversation just with a little story of the introduction of proxy voting for baby leave. So this was the way in which the Commons Reference Group working with the mother of the house, so this is the longest continuing sitting female MP, it's a, new, a completely new um, idea, the mother of the house, we've not really had one before, and she doesn't really exist in terms of the standing orders of the parliament, she has no powers, but it's a symbolic role. And I think what's really interesting in terms of how do we reform our parliaments is the role of what I'm calling gendered parliamentarianism, the extent to which women members of parliament work as women and for women on reforming their institution. They obviously have to work with male allies and particularly those in key roles where particular changes can be led. But what we saw was a reflection that the British parliament had no formal response to women having babies. They tried to deal with this using informal mechanisms that had been devised over time for the sick male MP, and they failed. And there was a huge um, uh, scandal over the failure of what's called pairing. There was embarrassing photographs of heavily pregnant women uh, delaying their cesarean, Tulip Sadiq, so that she could vote in the Brexit votes. We had the role of a chief whip um, so what I want to suggest out of this very, very quickly and, and speaks again to Mari, I think, is the role of embarrassment. That actually sometimes political parties, political actors, whether they're institutional um, or uh, administrative, respond to a series of events. Timing really spoke to me out of what Mari was saying as well in terms of those sexual harassment effects as well. And what we have with the, if we process trace, the introduction of this reform that became a permanent change to the standing orders in September 2020 was women's activism, a series of events that showed just how insensitive the House of Commons was and ultimately the ability of key actors within the institution, the mother of the house, the leader of the house who was also a woman, the new reference group who was remember taking forward that agenda, working with and ultimately getting the House to change its practices. Why does this matter? It matters obviously for the women MPs who are becoming mothers and, and fathers, and I can talk about that too, but it also feeds back into that loop between the supply and the demand. If you know that you can be a mother because the House has changed its practices, it might just enable you to think of yourself as someone who should put themselves forward to stand. So I my final slide is just a series of other reports that update, if you like, some of this earlier work on gender sensitive parliaments. But also, I do want to stress the impact of COVID and remote ways of working and how this is another way that our parliaments can be more inclusive, even if at the moment in the UK case, there is a lot of resistance. So I hope I've made, made, been able to give you a bit of a flavour of what's been going on in the British Parliament over the last few years. Thank you.